Yeah. All right. So we've now got the panel assembled, and I'm going to ask them to uh, speak for three minutes, um, responding to the lecture, giving their own thoughts. Um, and it's going to be just three minutes, isn't it? Um, because I know you're going to have questions that you'll want to ask, uh, and I do want to, to leave a good, um, um, good amount of time for you to ask the, the questions. So if I may start with Baroness um, Worthington, um, who is the Environmental Defence Fund for Europe. Um, the full biographies are in the leaflets that were on the desk, and I'm not going to repeat the information in there. I'll leave you to, to read that. Um, but would you like to, to start off with your thoughts, please? Um, thank you, and um, thank you, Emily, for a very stimulating talk. This is slightly alarming and depressing. Um, I think I've been in this game now for over a decade, and um, I, it never ceases to amaze me that there are still some people out there who question whether this is real. In fact, I had a lobbyist from the UK coal industry with me yesterday um, telling me that this was all a conspiracy, Emily, and that you were all blinded by groupthink and uh, that uh, this, is, this isn't real. Clearly, there's so much evidence now piling up. And, um, it, and as we've seen just in the news this weekend about the, the temperatures of February being so extraordinarily um, uh, alarming and, and the consequences of that in terms of coral bleaching, for example, in, in Australia, um, it being so serious. But it, it seems absolutely clear to me that we're living in a, in a period of consequences and that some of the impacts that I think, when I first started reading about this in the 1990s, I sort of thought, well, you know, that will be several decades away, um, seem to be occurring now uh, far more rapidly than we, than we thought. And so it's... It's difficult. I, I sit here as a, as a person who's worn many hats um, in trying to sort of address the, the climate risk. I've worked as a civil servant, crafting legislation. I've worked in the private sector, trying to understand how they think. And uh, I've, I've been in the NGO sector for most of my career, working uh, on campaigning and advocacy. And it's, it's, it's difficult to know how to respond to this challenge um, with maintaining a sense of realism of, of what's you know the evidence that we have, but also trying to maintain a sense of optimism. And what I loved about Emily's uh, lecture was that it, it was presenting a quite stark reality, but also saying that this this creates an opportunity. And that is where I um, sort of am on the spectrum. I'm a, a natural optimist, and I perhaps I've got a, a selection bias, but I, I see the good news that's emerging as, as we as a race and as a society respond to this challenge. And, I, and I, that gives me great hope. Uh, I, I'm fond of saying that I think that we have the, uh, we already know, uh, we already have the, the most powerful biomass fueled machine that will help us to address this, and that's our frontal cortex. And um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, that, it's that human ingenuity and human innovation that I think gives me hope. And, and I'm delighted to be addressing a room full of engineers because in my line of work, surrounded by politicians and economists, uh, you can get very depressed. But you talk to <laughs> engineers, and I like, I like that attitude of, um, you know, it's, a problem is there to be solved, and, uh, and the skills that we have as human beings developed over decades and centuries um, will be put to bear uh, to, to address this problem. And it, it feels to me that, you know, every person who wakes up to this challenge and, address, and decides to do something about it, we are like a, a brain with nodes being connected, and, and every node that gets connected, the ability to solve it gets greater. So, um, yes, I'm, I'm optimistic, um, and I'm totally in Emily's camp of all of the above technologies, huge range of them out there that we can talk about, I'm sure, in the questions. But okay. thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Paul Jowett, um, Harriet Watt University. Um, what are your thoughts, Paul? Um, well, first of all, fantastic lecture. Um, Emily, you mentioned urgency, and the, the parallel thought I had was immediacy. Of how how we deal with this depends on, I suppose, how how closely we feel it. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to a farmer in Bangladesh or a, a sheep farmer in Australia? What does it mean to a villager in Cumbria? How immediate is it to them? And thinking globally, what does it mean to Donald Trump? I mean, for whom sea level rise, his response might be, I'll just buy a bigger pump. So 
there is this, you know, how do we actually action this? I, I'm not sure. You, Emily, you mentioned the, the community of Davos, um, and it's obviously, it's now on their horizon, which is fantastic. But at the same time, you think, well, we're very clever people at Davos, there are all these clever economists with an economic model that seems to defy the second law of thermodynamics. So the fact that they're on the same page, is that, does that reassure me or, or worry me? Um, more to the point, I suppose, what does the man on the Clapham omnibus or the woman on the Clapham omnibus think about it? Because until they're engaged in this um, debate and process, then it's going to be difficult. I mean, in this country, we've, we've sort of reduced our uh, carbon footprint. How have we done it? We've exported it to China and India. And then we complain about them, saying, oh, your carbon footprint is much bigger than ours. It's your turn to do something, not not us. So I think we've got a real problem until we can get these arguments, which I think are so compelling to me and probably so compelling to everybody here. But they need to hit the political class and the public class in equal measure. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be... Well, frustrated, I think, but uh, it was a great start. Anyway, I feel really enthused now, so I'll have to go. I'll go up on the sandwich board tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and can I now invite Duncan Price, Bureau Happold Engineering? Thanks, what? Jean. Um, and thank you, Emily, for an inspiring lecture. Um, I actually, as a physicist and engineer, I do see this as a, as a really enormous challenge, and um, actually quite, I'm, you know, quite invigorated by trying to solve it. And that's why I dedicated my career to to this challenge. Um, I, I was kind of reflecting, I guess, on, on some of the UK policy as well, particularly around buildings and cities. For the first time at COP21, we had a, a buildings day recognising the importance of the built environment for addressing climate change. Um, it's, it's worth just rehearsing the arguments again, but buildings account for around 50% of UK CO2 emissions. And if 80% of the buildings that will be with us in 2050 already built, it's absolutely essential that we decarbonise the existing stock. And in addition, around a third of UK emissions are attributable to heat. And so, again, if we're serious about tackling climate change, we've got to think about heat. And it seems to me that both those areas are Cinderella sectors of government policy. And the Committee on Climate Change produced a report about two years ago, highlighting what they call the policy gap around the fourth carbon budget, which showed that uh, in the building sector, there's something like a 16 million tonnes of CO2 gap. Um, there was a number of policies they thought were firm, including building regulations, a number of policies like eco and green deal that they saw as at risk, and even then there was a policy gap. And of course, since that report's been published, uh, governments reduced or removed changes to the upcoming building regulations. It's canned the policy on zero carbon homes and non-domestic buildings, reduced the level of support under the energy, energy company obligation. Um, and, and, and then this week, and the budget has also published its response to the reform of the non-domestic energy efficiency policy without a clear energy efficiency strategy. So what we need is a clear, consistent, transparent uh, energy efficiency policy in the UK that gives the, uh, the investment market and the supply chain the confidence to invest in this space. And actually, many have argued for a very long time that investment in energy efficiency should be a national infrastructure policy priority because it increases energy security, because it increases life chances through addressing fuel poverty, and because it makes us more competitive as an economy. And actually, even by the government's own measure of infrastructure effectiveness, energy efficiency scores very high on the government's own definition. So we just need to shift our mindset away from this centralised view of energy policy to one that's much more embracing of decentralised energy solutions. And of course, energy efficiency should be a, an absolute no-brainer and a no-regrets policy decision. But actually, when you look at low-carbon heat, it's, it's rather more complicated because you do need to take a longer-term view. And we need to be looking at the fifth carbon budget and saying, what is our vision of energy policy in the UK? And uh, do we envisage uh, an all-electric heating system? Or is there a role for heat networks linked to energy from waste and waste heat from power stations? Or is it a bit of the two? And actually, these are quite fundamental issues for planning uh, our towns and our cities to make sure that they are fit for the next 50 years or 100 years. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, Duncan. And I'm sorry to say that Peter Clegg has been unable to be with us tonight because he's unwell. But thank you very much, Bill Gething, for 
stepping into his shoes um, and uh, joining us on the panel. So I, w I welcome you particularly. It's Thank a, you. It's a pleasure. Um, obviously, difficult being the last person to speak, but never mind. Um, I, rather than talk about heat, I'm going to talk about cooling. Um, and I think um, I, I'm interested in adaptation issues, and particularly things like overheating, which are uh, a, a problem we have already um, Start, are already starting to experience and I think because we have been focused on one aspect of trying to deal with climate change and to reduce heating costs and their heating energy and therefore we've had there's been some pretty significant unforeseen circumstances we're, we're building very differently now and we haven't really quite understood what the consequences of a, an absolute focus on winter heating when actually if you, if you reduce energy, cons energy consumption in the winter you shorten the heat, heating season and the rest of the year are trying to lose heat. And we haven't, we haven't really worked out quite how we keep buildings cool in summer. The other uh, issue about working about thinking about adaptation issues is that um, you start to realise the consequences of the changes that are coming. And it actually makes you realise we must not go there. <laughs> and it makes you focus on the mitigation um, uh, challenge as well. Um, nothing will happen until energy matters. And at the moment, energy doesn't matter to us. We talk about fuel poverty. I think that's a complete red herring. We, we all need to be in fuel poverty in some way or other. And I think that probably means a limit to the amount of energy we use, um, rather than trying to do it by cost. So um, people won't invest in improving their homes and, unless energy matters. At the moment, it's, it's, it's too cheap and too available. That's one thing. The other um, challenge I would say is that we're very good about talking about theory. We're terribly good about talking about strategy and policy. The devil is in the detail. And we, we really do need to deliver buildings that do what they say on the can when we design them. And at the moment, we don't do that. We must learn to do that. That's an easy thing to do. Yeah. We must do that. So checking what you've done. Yeah. Well, and, and, and also, uh, that implies that everyone on a building site is also knows that energy matters, so they know what the impact of their job is to make this building energy efficient. Thank you very much for, for that. I mean, this is a subject that's dear to my heart. When we set up Crane Environmental many years ago, we set out to, to green the built environment. Um, and it's, it's extremely important that we try and communicate that message. Um, I think one of our challenges is communication. Because when you talk about a, a two degree rise, you get more than two degrees between breakfast and lunch. So the public says, why are we concerned? Um, the, the difference between the, the daily variation that you actually experience and the impact of the average going up by two or three or four percent is very difficult to, to actually uh, communicate the significance of those differences. So we've got to try and somehow present that argument in a way which alarms people, because I think, like you, if you don't actually have a limit to the amount of energy or you don't feel alarmed, you might not do anything. Um, and I think we've got to galvanise people into actually making some changes to what they do. What I'd like to, to do before I open the... You're, gonna, you're all thinking about your questions now, aren't you? Because when I say, you know, have you got any questions, I want to... I want a forest of hands going up uh, and give me the difficulty of, of choosing which one. But let's put some questions to the audience. Let's have a bit of audience participation. Do you think that climate change is real? Who, who's, who's for that? Everyone. All right. Who's going to be bold enough to say no? Well, <laughs> we got one. OK, there's always one. Um, and uh, that's fine, because that gives us a, a debate. So I should be looking at you later. Um, is climate change driven by emissions? So do we believe that climate change is driven by emissions? Yes? Yeah. Do, do we think they're not? Can't tell. Right. OK. So slightly less enthusiasm, slightly less willingness to put hand up on that one. Who's in favor of fracking? Yeah, a limited number. I would assume that who isn't in favour of fracking? A very great number, right? So, um, and I expect some of you are sitting on the fence because I don't think I got all the hands going up 
on, on both those questions. I've got two more. Whoops, I'll pick that up in a minute. Well, one more. And the final question that the organisers have, have put for me is, who's in favour of nuclear power? Nuclear power, okay. Mm, sort of, some, some are being very up and some are sort of halfway. Yeah, so who isn't in favour of nuclear power? Still a significant number, all right? So we're going to sort of think about sort of what the energy mix looks like um, when we put the, that together. So that's, a, that's been a sort of a good flavour back to the panel as to sort of where the range of views are. So who's let be like the first one to, to ask a question? Who's, who's, so I told you I was going to go up with this one. In the front here, please. Who's got the microphones? One at the front, please. And if somebody else wants to put their hand up, then I can sort of organise the next microphone. Uh, so in, in the weight of all the evidence, is the panel, can the panel uh, point to any policies that the government is adopting to tackle this? I mean, as far as I can see, we've dumped zero carbon homes, we've dumped the Green Deal, various other grants and uh, support for renewables. We seem to be going backwards, don't we? What is, what is the government actually doing? <laughs> you start that one. <laughs> in a really unusual position as a Labour peer defending the Tory government. Um, so, so you've got to distinguish, I think... You don't have to defend them. No, I don't. <laughs> but, but, I, but I actually think um, it's too easy to just look at one or two individual things and assume that they've decided they've abandoned the climate change agenda. And the truth is that they are, they are doing some things that are very poorly implemented and, and motivated politically. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a, still a desire to stick to the plan of addressing climate change. And, and as, as unpalatable as it might seem, um, they've decided that they want to pursue a different set of technologies to the ones that perhaps have been pursued to date. And if you look at the budget, you'll see a clear indication of where their priorities lie, and that's with offshore wind and nuclear. Now, you can say that, and I should add a third, which is they are serious about replacing coal with gas. Now, overall, that is, a, that is actually a strategy that will bring emissions down and in, reduce carbon intensity. And it might actually deliver reductions in carbon intensity quicker than the energy vendor in Germany, which is deciding to pursue solar and wind and energy efficiency. So I, I don't think we can afford to have ideological positions on certain technologies. We should be working out what works. Now, this government's got a real problem in the sense that they've got some very unruly backbenchers who give the impression that they are all anti-climate. Um, they are a minority, and actually this government is very poor at communicating and is still pandering to some of those extreme right-wing views. But by and large, the, what I see is the government trying to find a, a new way of tackling climate change that properly addresses the three elements of the trilemma, being secure energy, low-cost energy, and, uh, and uh, low-carbon energy. Um, we can have a debate about energy efficiency for sure because that's no government, I don't think, anywhere has really solved that and they're struggling and, and continuing to struggle. But um, that the, 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 the idea that they've abandoned progress is, is not necessarily true. Any, any further comments? Well, I, I just add, I think the, the strongest ray of hope for me is the Climate Change Act, which itself is driving everything, you know, and... Um, and even if we end up leaving <coughs> Europe and some of the European directives fall away, um, the Climate Change Act is still there. And I think that's really, really encouraging. Um, and we've got the, the, the carbon budgets, so it's more about how you get there. And, but I think that the time dimension is critical. No, no, we're not. And we've got a plan for the fourth carbon budget and the fifth carbon budget. But, but the, for me, the issue is that we know... If you look at all the scenarios, you, as, as Emily said, we've got to throw the kitchen sink at it. We, we need to do everything. And, and actually, if we're to capture the opportunities on a global scale uh, and a global stage, we should be trying to invest in, in the things which are going to be progressing fastest. And if you look at renewable energy, it's been the single growth area, single fastest growth area in clean energy of the last few years. I think last year, something like 50% of... Uh, I'm going to get my, my stats here wrong. 50%, I think, of the new capacity has been wind. It's been a phenomenal increase, um, and we could have been a leader in CCS, carbon capture and storage, and yet the government's has sort of ditched its billion-pound competition, which could have potentially set us up on a global stage. And if you look at the, the, the global emissions, we really need to do everything. And if you 
ignore some of the big moves like carbon capture and storage, then you're, you're missing a big chance to, to invest in the future. So uh, I guess my own view is climate change action is really, really important. I'm really pleased that that's there. Government needs to do a lot more on energy efficiency, and we need to create the political space for them to do that. We need to be sending loud, clear, consistent messages as professionals and as individuals that we want this to happen, and it matters, and it matters for every constituency. And that creates a political space for the government, whichever flavour it is, to, to, to act and feel that it can act in, in people's homes and people's businesses. I have a fear that the lights will go out before we actually build the right number of power stations. I've got a question here, and then I've got another one over there, please, next. Okay, the reason I put my hand up for not believing in climate change, it's not strictly true, because since our planet has been in existence, climate change has been going on for millions and millions of years. Ice ages, warm ages, etc. It's man-made global warming that's caused all this, I believe. And as the... Uh, as was said, that uh, we've really looked at this since the 50s. And it's because of industrialization that our planet is warming up. And that's what I believe. We should spend less money on actual looking at the climate change and spending more money on looking at reducing the industrialization that is warming our planet up. Okay. What do you think? Who wants to? Well, I think that's an interesting take. I mean, um, I mean uh, obviously, the climate has changed very, very significantly in the past, and there have been... Uh, we talk about extinctions. I mean, 25% uh, of mammals uh, is knocked into a cocked hat by some of the previous extinctions, so we, thank God we're not going there. Um, but, well, you know, 75 or 85% of all species in the past... Um, I, I mean, I, I agree with you, um, but I think the, the difficulty, we can talk about we must do this, but how do we do it? And I, what I find, find difficulty in understanding is what is the event that will trigger action? Because at the moment, we, um, we are rather fiddling around the edges and making incremental changes. I, what, what, I don't believe that we're going to make sort of dramatic action um, until there is some uh, event that makes us really sit up and take notice. And I, I, I'd be interested to know what people think that event might be. <laughs> Are we intelligent enough to, 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 to intelligently change our ways when we're so um, motivated by self-interest? I mean, over the last decade, there's been a, a record in just about everything, whether it's it's temperature, whether it's flooding, whether it's drought. Uh, uh, I've got a slide where each year uh, over the last decade um, has got its own record on it. Now, that's not evidence of climate change, but it's jolly well consistent with the modelling that is associated with climate change. So you're saying, you know, you don't disagree with that, but it's, it's what do we do about it. I think you, you need to collect the data because it, without the data people certainly won't do anything. Um, and Paul, do you want to come in on that one? Just to go back to you, what, what can we do about it? There are some things you shouldn't do about it or we can't do about it. And Bill mentioned you can't manage um, energy consumption by cost, which I think is true. I mean, politically you can't do it because if you put energy up, then the people who have difficulty affording it are, are disadvantaged. And in, in any way, even if you do put it up, people just um, demand more resources uh, to, to buy more stuff. If you reduce the price, people don't use less. They use more. So, you know, and it's the same with carbon. I mean, the idea that we could manage carbon through a carbon price, I think it's absolute baloney. If we're serious about reducing carbon, then we should reduce carbon. But trying to manage it through some kind of market economics with a carbon price traded on a stock exchange is just bunk. I mean, you can see the headlines, don't you? Today's news... Um, 53 billion knocked off carbon price today in stock market crash. Does that mean we value the planet 53 billion pounds less today than we did yesterday? Of course it doesn't. So we, we, if, we go, if we're serious about controlling carbon, we need to control carbon. And we don't have to, it's, not about, it's not about market economics. Back to our friends in Davos. All right. 
question over there, and then the next one here, please. Uh, Mike Barry from Marks and Spencer. I just want to pick up on the point that Bill made about engaging millions of people in the UK in this. What's the role of smart meters being rolled out now to 25 million homes in the UK? What difference can that make? And on a secondary note to that, what's the role of community energy in linking people with renewables and the benefits they bring? So that's for the engineers and the architects. Emily, as a food retailer, <laughs> what's happening in the oceans? We worry about fish stocks as they warm, as the oceans acidify. What are you seeing out there in the real world? Right. Emily, do you want to start on that as an answer and give a little bit more pause for thought here? Um, I can do. Um, so one of the um, particular challenges for the oceans um, associated with all of this is that um, it's not only the impact of warming oceans, and Bryony mentioned coral bleaching, for example, um, that uh, is a consequence of our putting lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's also the impact of the oceans taking up a substantial amount of that carbon dioxide and then um, us resulting in a more acidic ocean. And um, as with all aspects of this, different parts of the world are affected um, more or less. It's not a uniform picture. And actually, in terms of ocean acidification, um, the cooler, cooler waters are affected more. So the waters around um, Antarctica, where my colleagues look, we've already seen the first um, in situ examples of damage to marine organism from the increasing acidification of the oceans around Antarctica. And um, I'm, uh, this is by no means my expertise, but I'm told that actually around the coasts of the UK, we have one of the world's great cold water um, coral reefs as well, which is <coughs> potentially significantly under threat um, from this. So that's in terms of the acidification, there are strong concerns. Um, also in terms of food stocks, uh, we have seen significant shifts of um, fish species, for example, in the North Sea, um, where there are potentially a range of different reasons um, that, that all come together in terms of explaining what, what, why we're seeing those differences. But certainly the change in temperature of the, uh, of the waters in the North Sea um, is thought to be uh, a significant factor in, in the change in distribution of fish stocks as well. So um, in, in various different dimensions, we are undoubtedly seeing changes in the ocean and that will directly affect um, our food resources. The second half of the question, can you now address the first half? <laughs> can you remember? <laughs> can I just add on the oceans one more? Oh, so certainly. Because um, um, Environmental Defence Fund, that my new post um, deals with climate change and oceans as two of its core topics of four that it works on. And so we're really interested in the overlap between the two, and but also we're interested in the policy approaches in the two spheres and how they can be... Um, lessons can be learned from how we regulate to stay within environmental limits. And uh, I don't want to get into a big argument about um, carbon pricing, but clearly regulation, smart regulation that's flexible is needed to enable a complex problem to be solved efficiently. And the way that we regulate for carbon at the moment is, it's a, it is a limit, it's a hard cap on carbon that allows flexibility to find the cheapest ways of solving it. Now, if you flip that over and look at fish and how we manage fish quota. Interestingly, we, we have a similar thing. We put a limit and we hand out allowances or rights to fish, but we treat fish, the fish community very differently and hardly give uh, fishermen any uh, control over their own assets. So whereas in, in carbon, the, the industry, industries that emit get an awful lot of rights and, and expectations of how they're managed. So there are lots of interesting lessons for as me as a policymaker about how do we as society meter out uh, rights to exploit the common good. And, and actually, fish and the way we manage fish is probably a much more pressing example of how we need to um, limit our effort and limit our impact uh, in smart ways. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. But e e even if we didn't have climate change, we'd still be trying to solve that problem. And I'm sure you know this from, from the work that you do. Uh, coming back on, on community energy, actually, just before that, um, just to say, from the, the carbon price floor and the auctioning of allowances under the EU emissions trading scheme raises about 60 billion for the exchequer over the next 15 years. And there's a, there's a case to be made for recycling the, that carbon tax revenue back into energy efficiency, which is what they do in France and it's what they're looking at doing in Germany. The Scottish government's now advocating that as well. Um, 
this government doesn't like hypothecation, except when it comes to road tax, perhaps, but um, there's quite a strong argument for, for doing that. On community energy, what I really love about community energy is it flips the whole thing around. It's far more positive because it's, it's, about, um, it's about kind of enlightened self-interest. There's some, some fantastic examples like Bath and West Community Energy who set up a whole series of solar cooperatives um, to, to bring forward solar parks and some other schemes. And it does a number of things. It, it helps you to originate projects and to find sites and to get those schemes through planning because you've got local support. And planning is probably the number one barrier to onshore renewable energy in this country. Um, the second is it is a good source of crowdfunding investment at good, at sort of reasonable interest rates. Um, if you've got a, a solar project at the moment um, and you're expecting to bring in, I know, sort of uh, the, the, the sort of long term wholesale capital markets, they might be looking for eight or ten percent return on that. It's effectively uh, pension funds. Um, but if you're a local investor, you may, be, you may be willing to accept a slightly lower return because it's a, you know, you're kind of getting some long-term local stake within that. Um, so it crowdsources investment, and I think that's, that's important. But crucially, it builds uh, social acceptance of, of uh, renewable energy and also a kind of sense of common purpose and ownership of, of solving the problem. And I think that's tremendously positive, and um, not to mention the social cohesion that goes with that and, and building stronger communities. So I'm all for it. I think um, it is a tough nut to crack, but there's some really, really fantastic examples out there of all different scales, whether it's villages or cooperatives or communities. And I think the, for, for me, the, the kind of the vision point actually is more like Germany, where 80, sorry, 60% of renewable energy projects are cooperative or community owned. And that's because the, the policies were set up to stimulate that. And it's a different approach from the UK and they've got more of a culture of community ownership and, and uh, cooperative ownership in Germany. But it, it shows what's possible if we choose to do it. I think getting energy generation closer to the people is a, is a good plan. And, and the, the people probably know about the island of Egg, which has its own little system. That also has a cap. So if, you're, if your energy requirement goes above six kilowatts, the, the electricity goes off for two hours. So you're, you're brought up short and you, you sort of understand about the relationship. Can I, can I just... It's probably good for the start to have a proper argument here because um, I just want to demur slightly from the German model in that, um, y that the only societies that are industrialised that have rapidly decarbonised have been Sweden and France, and they did it with nuclear in a decade. Germany's been on this kick now for you know coming up to a decade, and its carbon intensity has stayed pretty much the same the entire time. And that's because they've taken nuclear out of the equation and replaced it with renewables and kept their lignite and brown coal uh, just you know, churning away, running their industries. And it's been extraordinarily eye-wateringly expensive. And not many European countries can afford that, I'm afraid. So, you know, I just hesitate to sort of jump completely down the distributed energy isn't Germany wonderful. Uh, Germany is running a green and black economy, and the black economy is the one that's keeping the steel mills and the jobs running and the politics healthy. Could you do green and green? Could you have some large-scale renewables and some small-scale that engages the political support for this kind of systemic change that we're looking for? We could do green and blue, and I'd say blue is nuclear. That's some interesting debate going on. I've got a microphone here. Um, and the next one there, please. So lots of very stark put, can you put your hand and up? Um, slightly depressing uh, graphs. But I wonder if there's another trend which is actually much more positive, which we might think about as well. The Office of National Statistics about a week and a half ago brought out a really interesting report, which was in the papers for a very short amount of time. But actually, the report behind it is fascinating that the average British person has cons consumed about 15 tonnes of material in, tw in 2002, uh, 12 years later was consuming about 10 tonnes of material. The sort of decarbon, the, the dematerialisation in the Western world is really rapid um, and actually has very little to do with environmental policy, has a lot to do with technology. Um, and I just wonder whether, the, the, other, the other really interesting trend is um, the number of cities that are taking on green policies because they see it as a sort of a real virtue in terms of well-being, health, and it gives them a kind of an advantage, actually, I think, in terms of attracting interesting companies, the footloose, massive businesses, etc., and people who want to live in great places. I wonder whether those, we shouldn't be speaking to those sorts of agendas as well and thinking about the role of technology really in transforming our society in a way perhaps we don't recognise 
Uh, we don't recognise how fast it's sort of happening. So I think there are kind of feedbacks. And the third thing, I, I really like this sort of idea of all of us plugging as a sort of this big brain into this sort of system, which I, which I think is a sort of, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting idea. I, and, and to some extent, I think, you know, those trends that have happened have happened over the last 50 years. And I think we've only really, in the last 10, 15 years, become aware that we need to live in e an in ecological age. So the, the kind of the... This turnaround, sort of seeing it from where we are now, is very much at the foothill of a kind of, of that sort of challenge. And I just wonder whether um, actually there isn't, the, the sort of change, the mindset change isn't much faster than we imagine. Um, and there are, and there, the kitchen sink is, will be thrown at it, and it'll be incredibly interesting from an innovation perspective. I just thought it might be more positive. <laughs> I, th I think following that, just look at the difference in the sort of mobile phone technology and, and the rate of change there. Can we apply that to this problem? Can I quickly respond to that, Dan. I think it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic vision. And I think, you know, as engineers, we, we trade in data and we, we seek efficiency. And, and who would have thought that Airbnb would be the largest hotel chain in the world? And it's just using underutilised assets. And I think there's something quite appealing about the, the sharing economy and about removing that inefficiency and making much more with what we've got. And I think a lot of that is, under, is, is underpinned by data and data systems. And, and that, that coupled with us and our human capacity becomes the, the super brain, which helps to solve the, solve the challenges. So I, I agree. As for peak stuff, which I think is what you're kind of referring to, and I think um, IKEA was sort of referring to this, I think there's some debate about whether that's really peak stuff in terms of consuming stuff, or whether it's just producing stuff in the UK, because some of that has been overseas. But I know you've done a lot more work in this than I have, so maybe you know. Um, a few days ago, and they say that year on year, for every um, hundred thousand pounds worth of construction, we're using one to two percent less material because of the things like landfill tax and we're recycling more product. I, I assume that's one of the kind of reasons we're, we're becoming more efficient, actually. In, 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 so even in construction, yeah. it's not just books and CDs. It's it's actually going across society much more than we imagine, I think. I mean, that, I, it's all wonderful, fantastically exciting. 1% reduction in aggregate use is not going to save the planet. Um, we still occupy more and more space at a higher temperature, and that is a physical thing. We can either put a load of coats on and use all that stuff, uh, uh, which is what they did in 1947. You know, in that winter, everyone put their coats on and went to bed for three months. That, that is one way of saving carbon. Perhaps mm. that's why I was born in 1948. <laughs> 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 but you know, there are, that's all fantastic. And, and that same ingenuity can be applied to some of these other problems. But there are some physical, boring engineering things that need to be done too. Yeah. <laughs> Move on. To yeah. Um, if I could, uh, as it were, speak up for the carbon tax. Uh, idea. I mean, there, there certainly seems to be, I think, a link uh, between the carbon tax, which is uh, spread across the whole economy, um, as it is in the Scandinavian countries, and reduction in carbon emissions, because there's a direct incentive then for uh, even ordinary people to do that. And in the UK, when it comes to heating, for example, there's no carbon tax on domestic uh, gas for, for heating. In fact, there's a reduced rate of VAT. And there's no encouragement really there through the price of gas, which is our main form of, uh, of heating buildings in the UK, um, and actually insulating your, your home. Um, I think on the question of a public opinion, um, public opinion is important because politicians, democratic politicians, have to follow public opinion to a certain degree. And it also bolsters them when they are, are trying to hold at arm's, arm's length various interest groups which have an interest in keeping things as they are at the moment. And those groups are very strong in our society and they shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, my, my final point, which is really, I suppose, a question, is that, um, in fact, there's plenty of money in the world. The, the world seems to be awash with, uh, with money at the moment, looking for somewhere safe to invest. And is how can we use that money in the UK to actually do those fundamental changes that we need to do in the fabric of our, of our uh, homes and our buildings and also in our energy supply? How can we use that money um, how can we attract that money in a way that actually can achieve those changes? Who wants to start with that one? Lots of really good topics. Um, on Quickly on uh, carbon tax on heat, I completely agree. It's completely mad that we've just decided to load 
one part of the economy with a, with a fairly large carbon tax, actually, um, and let the other side, which is transport and heat, completely off the hook. And it's all down to politics. So, you know, picking up on your point, if there was a voice... So going into the budget, my inbox was flooded with fairer fuel tax lobbying. Um, people do not want to see their um, petrol prices going up. Um, even though, actually, they're materially massively down overall because of the fall in oil prices. But, you know, still that visceral don't tax our cars lobby is really strong. If there were another countervailing force saying, you know what, climate change really matters and transport emissions need to be paying their price, that would make things a lot easier. So please do all join your political parties, send the emails and count. Please get involved in that debate because it needs to happen. And, and that carbon pricing... You know that yeah, I, I just I don't actually agree that it doesn't work. It does work, and we, the reason we're seeing coal coming off in the UK now, and it is coming off quite rapidly, is because we have a co top-up carbon price on top of the EU price designed to get uh, coal off the system. So it does absolutely work. But doesn't that mean fuel poverty? I mean, it's a, it's a price mechanism. Doesn't that just automatically cause a problem? Uh, well, define fuel poverty. I mean, it's, it's, you've got to compare it against the counterfactual. So if wholesale prices are down or, or level, um, actually, you're, and you're investing in efficiency improvements, your bills actually might be staying static, mm. even if the unit price is going up. Yeah. But people don't invest in efficiency. Well, they are. Well, are they? Yes. We want more of it. <laughs> uh, I've got the microphone at the back there. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, first, I just wanted to make a little point on uh, quoting Edward O. Wilson, the Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist. We are at present in one of the great mass extinctions. I think it's the fifth mass extinction. And that's a little sort of uh, comment on behalf of, I think it's the other 10 million species on the planet at the moment. Um, but then the main point is that um, we've, uh, through government, funded research, uh, Technology Strategy Board, now Innovate Research, Building Performance Evaluation, we found that we, a, a number of buildings have used methodologies that have delivered more than 80% and approaching 90% overall energy reductions in, 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 uh, in retrofit, and, uh, and new buildings that achieve fantastic reductions as well. And that's much, much higher uh, delivery of energy efficiency than David Mackay envisaged in his book. And part of the reason, and he's admitted to this on his website, is that he, he, he misunderstood the, the, um, the definition of primary energy. And he thought that was metered energy. And it's actually a factor of 2.7 in the UK different between metered energy and primary energy. And, and I just think there must now be a time, you know, this must be a time to actually review um, the conclusions that he comes to and recognise that the energy efficiency that Germany is delivering, in spite of being an, a hugely industrialised uh, country, um, that, you know, that we, we can perhaps do without nuclear. I, I think we can do without nuclear if we deliver really, really good energy efficiency savings. And, and that is possible. I think there's a, there's a general... Um, it kind of addresses Ian's point as well about how do you get this wall of money into low carbon projects and, and it's all about risk isn't it it's all about understanding the technical risks the financial risks, the deployment risks and managing those so that there is a sufficient volume and a pipeline of, of investment grade projects for investors of all flavours and sizes to put the money into and fundamentally it's about understanding if you put your money into a project whether it's an energy efficiency project or a solar project or a heat project you're going to get a return on your investment, and, it, and it's going to do what it says on the tin. And, and actually, that's, that's fantastically exciting for engineers because we, we and, and architects and other professionals, because we kind of understand a lot of that stuff and where those technical risks lie. And, and some great examples like the Investor Confidence Project, which I think um, the uh, Environmental Defence Fund is also um, helping to, to sort of transport from the US into the, into the European situation as well. Um, and it, which is trying to, to codify where those risks lie, how do you manage those, so that you can bring forward a whole bunch of projects at scale and of the depth of energy efficiency that you, that you can deliver, um, so that our pension funds are putting money into energy efficiency projects. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, 
you're, I know you're a passive house uh, uh, advocate, and, and that's, a, that's a fantastic example of how you actually achieve things in practice um, and in theory together. But the level of um, attention to detail to do that is exceptional. And that's, that's the level of potential to, to detail we need to get to in our construction uh, practice to, to achieve that. Um, in terms of investment, um, though, uh, I mean, to deal with the existing stock, to get an 80% reduction, you put quite a lot of strain on the existing stock anyway in terms of all sorts of moisture issues. Um, but the projects that have achieved that, that you're, you're spending 100 grand per house-ish, it will drop, no doubt, but that's a, that's a massive investment, and you never get a, you never get a return uh, with energy priced as it is. So you need to price energy at the cost it, uh, to, in effect, to do it in the reverse. Take the cost it, it, it takes to reduce the energy and then price the energy accordingly. That's my Bill, opinion. Is there, yeah. is there an argument that says we should be valuing all those co-benefits better as well? You know, the health, well-being, and productivity. Mm. Because the leverage on the energy price well, is, is maybe 10 times as great if it's about performance of the people and the quality and the experience of the space that your, your it, building great. is. Great, but I don't, know how, I don't know how you value it. Oh, I mean, in, in terms of... Uh, because there is only one bottom line. There's, the, the triple bottom line is a myth. I, 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 would, I would argue that's changing. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the work that, that World GBC has been doing in the space and UK GBC has been trying to, to put a, a framework around how do you actually value uh, health and well-being and, right. and how that could translate to okay. productivity. Well, we're, very, we're, we're very bad in this society at... Um, spending money in one area in order to reap benefits in another. Yeah. So linking health um, to someone investing in their own home, is a, is a, we don't do it very well. I don't no. think. I suppose that's what governments are supposed to do. Is that? Good. Yeah, you, you commented about sort of the extinction of the species. Uh, I believe that the planet will continue, but whether or not the conditions on the planet will be suitable for us to continue is another matter. Um, and I, I think that's the important point. Um, is that we talk about the extinction of other species, but we are making it very, very hard to live it our, ourselves in the, in the sort of rather tight, time, uh, tight temperature gaps that we can comfortably survive in. I've um, got the microphone at the back, and then I've got another one at the front, um, and I might take you as the last question. Thank you very much. Um, if I think about where we are, we're in London, and in May we have an election for a London mayor. If um, you have the opportunity to advise the London mayor on how to reduce the footprint of London in one of three areas, the buildings, food, and transport, which one would you pick, and what would your advice be to the London mayor? Because we have an enormous footprint, much beyond our geographical footprint. Paul, can I give you a sort of starter on this one? Uh, well, I wish you hadn't. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, luckily, I live in Edinburgh, so the problem is slightly different for me. Well, you've um, just still got a big footprint up there as well. Well, I've got a big footprint getting down here, I suppose. But anyway, um, I think probably on buildings. Uh, I'm not too sure why I say that, but I, I, I think that's where I'd do it. But it is, I think retrofit is not particularly easy. And I think that's the difficulty, but... Um, I think probably on buildings. I mean, the, the transport one's interesting because we, uh, we, you've got, you're about to get Crossrail. You, you're about to get, well, maybe get High Speed 2 to Birmingham. And I, th I have to think that High Speed 2 to Birmingham is a complete nonsense, but that's um, by the by. But it's basically going to suck more people into, into London for no great benefit. And, um, you know, the only thing wrong with the London-Birmingham journey was New Street and Euston. And they've sorted out New Street. And if you sorted out... Uh, Houston, you wouldn't you wouldn't be bothered to spend all that money to cut the journey time by a little bit, but <laughs> right. So yes, I think buildings. Okay, right. Just um, a quick vote through. Uh, I'd absolutely say transport far and away above everything. Transport above everything else. Um, it's the the thing that you when you come out of a train into King's Cross and see the diesel that's building up under that horrible canopy and just think, how are we still inhaling this? It's ridiculous. Then you've got all the diesel fumes of all the taxis that fill this street, the streets. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous, and it's been the biggest failure of the current mayor uh, that he's not addressed this. He tried to stick the pollut pollutants to the floor instead of actually addressing the sources, which is ridiculous. And I, I would just add, I've looked at Zach's um, Green Manifesto. Um, it's a very, very old-fashioned set of green priorities, and I was quite surprised by it. Um, and and I, I absolutely disagree with the obsession at the moment with solar. 
Um, there is a role for solar. It's in India and mostly around the, equ the equator. Uh, we can spend an awful lot of money looking, making these glitzy, glassy, glass roof projects look a bit nicer because they've got PV on it. It doesn't actually get at the heart of what a city needs for its energy. And I would actually look at the Thames and re bring Tidal back onto the Thames. That's the one thing he should do. OK. Um, I, would, I would also vote for transport. I think um, the mayor should be... Um, putting serious effort into cleaning up our air in London, which is which means bringing forward Crossrail 2, Crossrail 3, massive investment in the public realm. Um, not only do you get all those immediate health benefits, but you get a much better, more productive city with better connections to support the economic functions of a city, the transactions, the, the connections. Um, but it also means you can open up the windows and you can let your buildings breathe and you don't have sealed buildings because of the pollution, because of the noise, and you, be, you become a much, much more successful city. So what, what's not to like about it? I'd start there. I, so. I'd rather agree. I mean, London's jolly lucky in having a public, in having a public transport system that works, of course, which, are, you know, when you come from anywhere else is, is a different question. And that's one of the good things about cities. They are efficient at moving people around compared with suburban you know, neighbourhoods. Um, I, just, I think my primary advice to him would be to refer back to Ken Livingstone's carbon plan for London, which seemed to me rather good. It right. shouldn't get forgotten. Okay, thank you very much. I've got the microphone down there, and then I'm going to take that one as the very last question. Well, we've almost stumbled upon my question. Um, we've got these investment and policies to reduce carbon in transport and in energy, but like you said, Duncan, um, the big one of the biggest issues underneath that umbrella of everything we need to do is the existing housing stock. Um, but we can continue. We, we as engineers know how to do that. We continue chatting to politicians, but they don't have the authority to be able to, or the finance to influence that. Who are the clients that we need to convince to give us the money to decarbonize that um, area? And what do we need to adopt a business model to convince them that it's a good idea and worth the investment? I think you need to, you need to segment your market. There's a, there's a kind of well understood sort of market adoption curve, starting with your early adopters and moving on. Um, actually, if you look at um, if you look at the UK housing stock, um, a lot of the real effort and the heavy lifting has been done by the social housing sector because it has volume. Um, arguably, that's the wrong end <laughs> in terms of the market adoption curve. But they, they have the scale and they have the, the long-term view of owning assets and managing assets and actually um, had a really good ability to borrow money. Um, arguably, I say had because they've been challenged um, in terms of their credit ratings at the moment. But I've done lots of work with big housing associations and they, you know, generally they're double AA or triple AAA, AAA credit rated. They can borrow off the capital markets at not bottom rates. Um, they can take a long-term view. They, and, and, they, and they have been actually very instrumental, I would argue, in demonstrating how to achieve economies of scale, the technical solutions, the financial solutions, and um, all power to them. I think they've been really, really powerful in doing that. And, and outside of that, um, private housing you know, in London, the, the scheme like the Renew programme in London, led by the GLA, has been quite, quite useful. But ultimately, uh, private rented sector is a really, really difficult nut to crack. And actually having the right carrots and sticks and tambourines to drive the market is really, really important. And I'll refer you to the UK Green Building Council work on retrofit incentives for one you know, view of how you could do that with stamp duty and uh, variable stamp duty and council tax banding and so on. But... You know, the, the bottom line is that you've got to mobilise 20-odd million homes, and that is really, really difficult. And I've, I've just done a loft extension, and it is just painful. It's supposed to take eight weeks. It took six months. You know, in a pile of waste in the garden, um, you know, OK, I've got some triple glazed windows out of it, but, you know, it, it was, there was a massive, massive hassle. And, and that's, that's just, you know, someone that should find it easier. But can I just add two um, insights from the world of policy and politics on this as well, that... And you might scratch your head and say, but it's such an obvious thing, why aren't we doing energy efficiency? Well, from a Treasury's point of view, I'm sad to say, um, anything that reduces consumption really just means less revenue for them. So uh, you, you have to get your head around this. There's a sort of myth that, oh, Treasury's tax things that they want to see less of. Not true. Treasuries love taxing things that they're going to think of stick, or stick around and give them revenue. So, you know, you've got to find a way for the energy efficiency endeavour to give the Treasury what it wants, and that is steady income from tra tax. And so all this, you know, we all go around thinking 
uh, the believing the economists when they say, oh, yes, you should you know, relieve the pressure on, on, uh, on good things in society and, and put the taxes on the bad stuff. Actually, that, that isn't really helpful if you want a treasury on side. Um, the other thing I'd just say is that um, uh, you know, the, industry, the insulation industry um, has got to take a long, hard look at itself because I remember, um, it was probably going back eight or ten years now, um, at, at DEFRA saying that we can really ramp up our pressure on the, on the energy companies to insulate everywhere. Um, that's what we're proposing. And they all said, no, no, don't do that. We'll be out of business in five years if you do that. That, you know, how mad is that? But that, that's the response you get, that there, there, are, there, are, there are people whose vested interest is to just do this steadily. We don't want any boom and bust. Let's just keep things going. And that's really seriously got to be challenged. Hmm. I'm going to take the last question at the back there, Dave. Thank you very much, Jean. Appreciate the honour. Um, it's a nice, easy question to finish with. I wonder to what extent the panel believe that the UK's ability to do the right thing by climate change might be compromised or aided by uh, leaving the EU. <laughs> and that question, I, didn't, I thought of that question when we, when we started to talk about fisheries, but I'm not thinking of fisheries specifically. That's just what prompted the question. Right, now we're into a whole new ball game, and there was me thinking I was going to finish at half past eight. <laughs> I can give it just a quick, rather facetious answer. I mean, I, it feels to me that the EU is the only driver of any, any environmental agenda left. Um, so I think it's a... Uh, I'm a I think it would be rather a bad idea if we left, but other people may know more about this. Than okay. uh, not, notwithstanding what I said earlier about the importance of the uh, UK Climate Change Act, I'd, I'd echo that Europe is such a strong driving force. It's Europe that negotiates on block uh, uh, the international agreements, and it's the European Performance of Buildings Directive, the European Energy Efficiency Directive, the European Energy Services Directive, the Near Zero Carbon Buildings Directive. These are all the things which are driving our policies at the moment. Um, I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure if there was a political will in the UK, we could do it as well. But at the moment, I see these are the strongest drivers for well, we UK are great policy. contributors to those policies, yeah. actually. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, obviously, we should stay in. It's complete madness to think that it would be better if we come out. But, um, but it, it's not necessarily because I think Europe is the source of all wisdom. I think actually lots of things Europe does is terrible. But at least if we're in, we can try and stop some of the terrible things. I mean, one, one example that frustrates me is that the EU tendency to just, um, you know, harmonisation is everything. So you get them putting out really stupid statements on hoovers. But, you know, really? A thing that sits in your closet and is used once a week, is that really the big thing? What about Romania venting CH4? Uh, that's surely a bigger climate issue than, than you know, what's going to be next? Hair dryers, honestly? Yes. There, there is some kind of mad somebody in Brussels that needs to just be locked in a cupboard and then, <laughs> and then we can actually get on to the really important stuff like cement, steel industry, glass manufacturing, the big stuff and, and have some standardisation and some innovation there which they completely ignore and uh, so yes I really think we should stay in but it's not because of a love of European bureaucracy. Yeah. Okay. I think a right. Scottish view. Uh, well a Scottish view, a note of unanimity I think that we should stay in but uh, of course Nicola Sturgeon said if England votes out, then Scotland's going to have another referendum, because I'm curious if, if, if Britain as a whole voted to stay in, and Scotland voted out, would she want a referendum? I suspect that, I suspect that won't happen. Um, no, I, th I think we should stay in for all the reasons stated, even despite some of the stupidities. And um, we've ended on a note of unanimity, and going back to a previous question, I'm now utterly persuaded that transport is a more important thing than what I said, which is building. So, um, it, you, this meeting has changed one mind, so that's, uh, <laughs> I hope it's changed uh, some more to realise how important this whole debate and lecture has been. It's been uh, a revelatory experience in terms of the information we've been provided with, and uh, I've enjoyed the discussion too. Thank you. Is there anything you want to comment on? Not necessarily on, you, you're very welcome to comment on the, the uh, uh, June debate, but um, is there anything that you want to sort of say? Is well, let me, let me comment on both. So it's just on the European debate. Uh, the, um, the one thing that I would add differently is that there are clearly, from a scientific research perspective, there have been very many great examples of cooperation um, in Europe and scientific research. And indeed, the very first time that I went up to the Arctic, um, that started me on my polar science career was a part of a large European-funded um, 
research campaign looking at ozone depletion in the Arctic, which would have been impossible at a country level to have undertaken. So there's clear benefits in, in terms of scientific research. Um, in terms of reflections, just on the on the panel discussion, I mean, it's it's clear to me we've come, touched lots of areas that you know to do might broadly be characterised as being to do with societal response, to do with political response, and and to do with engineering response. Um, and and it strikes me as though, I, I, like Bryony, I've been in this area for a long, long time, and the typical reaction it's such a big problem. And um, people that I've interacted with of all levels have typically reacted to that very big problem by saying they should do something about it. Yes. <laughs> and to my mind, firstly, actually they, if they are governments, they have actually made a first step in Paris and much more ambitious step than anybody had anticipated. And I kind of feel that it's time for us as individuals to pay catch up now. It's time for us to no longer use that excuse that they should do something. And we should really think as individuals, it's very easy to come along to events like this and think, gosh, that sounds terribly bad. Yeah. And then to go back tomorrow and do exactly the same as we've always yeah. ever done. Yeah. It takes one person in this room to have a new idea of how to do something differently that could potentially be game changing. So the challenge is, what are you going to be doing <laughs> what differently are you going to do? tonight and tomorrow um, and that's going to change the, the world? Um, can I conclude by saying it's been a real privilege and, and pleasure to, to chair the panel this evening. Um, and thank you very much, too, for, for all your questions, because that makes my life a, an awful lot easier when there's a sort of flow of questions coming. And in preparation for this evening... Um, uh, our son came home last weekend, and our younger son works for British Antarctic Survey, um, and so I, I had a, a full briefing um, before uh, this evening. Um, as we often do when he comes back, we get our climate change tutorial uh, over dinner. Um, and so it is important that everybody bears this in mind and does something about it. And I think that's a that's the, the message that I'd like to get out. Now, I see Gavin waiting in the wings to do the proper thank yous, uh, if you'd like to come forward and say thank you to everybody. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to... <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to, um, to Emily for taking us on a... When Emily got up to start a lecture, I thought, gosh, this is going to be good. And I settled in. And then she took us on this roller coaster. Now, I, I like to think that I know quite a bit about climate change, but I felt myself slipping down into the trough of depression and then being dragged and brought up to the kitchen sink at the end. But <laughs> definitely some food for thought. Um, a lot of food for thought there. And then thanks for Jean for expertly steering us. When I talked to Jean on the phone when we were organising this event, I knew I was in safe hands as soon as she said the first few words that we were going to finish at 8.30. We were going to be steered expertly through this. And thanks to the panel uh, for, for, bringing, for bringing the debate to life um, and for sparring with one another and for uh, taking the questions. And, and really, I think what, what, we, what I take from the panel is it's an incredibly... The actual mitigation and adaptation and what we should be doing as engineers and engaging in engineers is an incredibly complex area. What is right is open for debate and we've seen that ably um, demonstrated tonight in terms of the way that we've talked around the various different things that we could be engaging in. I'd like to thank Lorraine Milne who has organised tonight uh, and uh, makes me look like I know what I'm doing. So thank you, Lorraine. Um, the partners of Bureau Happold who fund the Happold Foundation and allow me to um, put on these events, which I think I feel are important. Um, I was reminded of um, Ben Rogers and, and Charlie Ledbetter at the uh, Centre for London. Charlie, Charlie's got a way of talking about things, and he, he talks about systems and empathy. And he talks about the two one can comp compensate for another. And when you talk about cities and nations, we as engineers tend to think about systems because we like 
systems and we can design systems. And behaviours and the way that people behave to one another, to engineers, is a whole vague science. But one can compensate for the other. So you can have relatively poor systems and yet high empathy and somehow a city functions. And likewise, you can have quite cold cities that have very good systems, but people aren't quite as engaged. And I think it's one of the things that we, we need to think about as engineers is a lot of we, what we've been talking about tonight is not just about systems. A lot of it's about behaviours and the, the way that we behave with one another. And thinking about how we influence those behaviours as well as the systems that we design is, is really important. When I was um, coming out tonight, I was talking to one of my partners. He said, you're making a lot of noise. I said, Porrick, what do you mean? <laughs> why? What, what do you mean, why am I making a lot of noise? And I do, I, I do have a loud voice in the office, and I do share an office with Porrick. So I thought, really? He said, you're sending all these emails out about climate change. And you're, you know, you're, you, there's all this noise going on about getting people to your events and everything else. And I went, oh, yeah, OK. Are you coming tonight, Porrick? Well, no. And he's not here. <laughs> but what I'm going to go back and say to Porrick tomorrow is I haven't even begun to start. <laughs> I've got to get into that kitchen and get a hold of that kitchen sink. And Porrick's going to be one of the first people that I throw it at. But we seriously do, as engineers, I, I st where we started at the beginning, we do need to influence. We can't wait for society to come to us and tell us what they want. We need to step up to the plate and tell society what society needs based on what's happening around it. You've got a... As you came in, you've got one of these folders. Um, on the back are uh, future events that the Happel Foundation is, is running. The next one is, the, uh, is on the 6th of April, and it has an economic flavour to it. And the question that we're posing is, must cities grow to flourish? And it fits within our urbanisation agenda. It would be great to see you there. Uh, we hold them, they start at uh, 6 o'clock, and we hold them at the building centre. And lastly, after, after that roller coaster journey that Emily has taken us on, I need a drink. And I'd like to invite all of you uh, to join us in a drink upstairs at the Riverview Room, uh, where we'd like to see you just up the stairs. Thank you very much, and look forward to talking to you later.